Matthew chapter number three. We're gonna continue in the, our study on look, t- taking a look at baptism. And, and um, last week, if you talked about, we, we talked about how water baptism is really a, a hotly debated item. And, uh, you know, it's really hotly debated as far as all the different methods of baptism, right, between the Presbyterians and the Lutherans and the Methodists and the Church of Christ, the Campbellites and, and the Baptists, and, and then if you want to throw in the Catholics on top of that. And so it's really debated hotly, you know, within them. But if you really want to see how hot the debate can get, you know, just take the position that Paul has a distinctive ministry and that there's one baptism today, as the book of Ephesians says, and that that baptism is a spiritual baptism and not water. And if you want to see how much, how, how hot the debate can get and how hot the water will boil, you know, just bring up that position. So there's a lot of, uh, of debate. And because of that, there's there's a lot of different denominations that we've talked about and a lot of the denominations take different, different views on different things and baptism is one of the main things that they divide over and that cause a difference. There's the difference between sprinkling and immersion and I don't remember if I mentioned last week that you know, in Genesis chapter number 17 uh, where, we were, where we left off in our study that there was the covenant of circumcision that was implemented with Abraham and his household. And uh, circumcision was not just for the adults. Circumcision was when you have the male children in your house on the eighth day, you were to circumcise them. So what people uh, who think that, who, who fail to see the dispensation of grace, they fail to see the revelation of the mystery, they fail to see Paul's distinctive ministry that we are not Israel, that as Paul says in Romans chapter 11, that, that Israel has been cut off for their unbelief. Those who fail to see that we're not Israel and they're still trying to live according to the, to, to Israel's program, they take that and they see their circumcision over there and they say that circumcision is no longer required today, but what replaces circumcision is water baptism. And water baptism is that new sign that you have, the new the new ordinance, the new uh, means of grace in order to be in covenant relationship with God. And so there are some denominations that place a very high value on water and what water does on, on, on your flesh. Um, so that's why they'll come and you'll have a baby being sprinkled with baptism. They, they do that to babies because what did they do with circumcision? You would circumcise your children when they were babies, right? And so we see that being done to infants. But you have the Baptists over here. And the Baptists will say, you don't water baptize anyone until they profess uh, belief, faith. And so therefore, a Baptist would say, we only water baptize adults because adults are the only ones who can, who can believe. So what you have is a mass confusion and not rightly dividing the word of truth. You have those who are more close to Israel's program who then sprinkle the baptism because they think we're Israel. You have the Baptists who a lot of them are really good on Paul's gospel and preach a clear gospel of the grace of God to save you from your sins, but then they'll hold on, you know, there might be, you know, the Acts 2 type or, or whatever when it comes to their dispensational belief. And therefore they hold on to the water. And what they'll do is they'll say, yeah, but the water is for the adults who believe because it's a sign of your faith. Well, now we're getting into two different, what baptism actually means for a Presbyterian and a Baptist then would be two different things, right? Two very different things. And so, uh, and, and then you could get into the issue of salvation or non-salvation. My point being, and to point that out, is there's a reason why they believe what they believe, and the reason why they believe it is an error. Um, And of course, if we thought that they were right, we would be teaching it here. But there's not a lot of clarity on the subject within Christianity, because I feel... um, what, what I think is, I, l- listen, anybody who talks on water baptism, if you get a Presbyterian or a Baptist, they would stand up here and they would say, the, the Bible is really clear on this subject. The Bible has a lot to say about baptism and it's really clear on it. So I realize in saying that I think the Bible is very clear on it, i saying the same thing they do. Now, the proof is in the pudding, right? So we started looking at some scriptures last week as to why was Christ baptized. 
And the reason why we're looking at why Christ was baptized is because one of the reasons or that people will give is that you should be baptized in obedience to Christ or we're baptized because Christ was baptized and so therefore we should be uh, obedient to him and uh, in his baptism. And what I just wanted to look at is, is that true? Is it true that we're, we should be water baptized because Christ was baptized? And so what we started to look at is the reasons why Christ was baptized. Now, I know that all of you have a memory like a trap and you remember better than I do. And you remember point number one of why Christ was baptized from last week, right? Everybody remembers? Yeah. I, I know, I'd be in the same boat. So reason number one was that the reason why Christ was baptized was to fulfill all righteousness. So Matthew chapter number three, I asked you to turn there earlier. Let's, let's read beginning in verse number 11 of Matthew chapter number three. Matthew chapter three, verse 11. John is here going to be speaking and he says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will truly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. So the point here is John, he tells you what he's doing, right? And I, I think I pointed this out last week. I want to be very clear. John tells you what he's doing, how he's doing it, and why he's doing it. He tells you what he's doing. In verse number 11, I indeed baptize. John is saying, this is what I'm doing. I'm baptizing. How are you doing it, John? With water. Why are you doing it, John? Unto repentance. So if you're going to repent of something, and we, we looked at some verses last week, what does it mean if you're going to repent? Now, if you turn into a, 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 and Larry had the right answer, but if you, if you hear a, um, someone, a, a preacher, um, I, you hear it taught where it says, when they say repentance, that means you need to turn from your sins. And you hear it taught from a, from a pulpit where someone's saying, you need to repent and get right with God. And what they're saying is, is that you need to turn from your sinful ways, you need to turn from your sin and get right with God, and you need to stop sinning. Now, repenting does not mean turning from sin. Repent means, as Larry said, changing your mind. So what would it be that Israel needed to change their mind about? Well, they needed to change their mind about not, not doing what they should have been doing, not doing the, fulfilling the righteousness of the, of, of the law or not following the law. Um, and so they come along and he says, I'm doing this for repentance so you can acknowledge. And Christ says, he comes and John forbade him in verse number 14 from being water baptized. John says, no, no, no. Because why would John forbid Christ from being water baptized of him? Because John knows that the Lord Jesus Christ, as Israel's Messiah, does not need to be water baptized unto repentance. There is nothing that the Lord Jesus Christ had to change his mind about. He was perfect. He was sinless. He had done no wrong. He did not need to change his mind. So John says, no, no, no. I need to be baptized of thee, and you're coming to me. And Jesus answered and said unto him, suffer it to be so, allow it to be, and Christ gives the reason, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. So 
the reason, the first reason that Christ was baptized was to fulfill all righteousness. We looked at that last week. We're not going to talk about what that means. It, it, you know, it deals with the, the law and the righteous requirements of the law. To, to be washed according to the law, you would have to wash a, a sacrifice. A priest would have to be washed before they go in. So this is all part of the law. And the law is to bring about righteousness, but we know under the dispensation of grace, we know according to what God has communicated us that the law can't be bring about righteousness in our sinful flesh, right? That's why Christ had to come and die on the cross for our sins, because he was the only one who could be righteous. But he's coming and he's saying, I'm being water baptized in order to fulfill all righteousness. And so the very simple thing that I wanted to, to relate to you as we look at that reason is, would you be able to fulfill all righteousness by being water baptized? No, you're not the sacrifice. You're not the priest. And so your example, you're not following Christ after his baptism. Because as, as good as Jim is, he's not perfect. And he's not the sacrifice for us. And as the priest, the priest had to wash themselves to cleanse themselves before they could go into the temple. And we talked about in Hebrews last week how the Lord Jesus Christ is the great high priest for Israel. So he would be washed. So reason number one that Christ was baptized was to, require, uh, was, um, to fulfill all righteousness. Now reason number two is identification. And reason number two and three are both really an identification, but identification of two different things. Um, he did it to identify himself with Israel, but not just the nation of Israel, because he didn't identify himself with the Pharisees, because what did the Pharisees do? They rejected the will of God. Um, what he did is he identified himself with those who were from Israel who were coming out and being water baptized and identifying themselves as the believing remnant in Israel. And so there were, there were believers that were coming out to John's baptism that were saying, I agree with what you're saying, John, about repenting. And, and so they're agreeing with John's pronouncement and saying, I'm going to be water baptized to identify myself with this group of believers. They were repenting and, and, and changing their mind about, uh, uh, about their sinful ways. And this was all part of John the Baptist preparing the way from the, for the Lord because he was turning the hearts of the people of Israel back to God. Look at Luke chapter number three. Luke chapter number three. Look at verse number 21 of Luke chapter number three. It says, now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven, which said, thou art my beloved son, in thee I am well pleased. Now, what I wanted to point out there is you notice when was it that the Lord Jesus Christ was baptized? Did he wait? You know how you read sometimes in, in the gospel accounts how when Christ was there that he would withdraw himself from the crowd? You, you remember reading that in circum, certain circumstances? Did he wait until everybody had been water baptized and just go out when it would only be him? When was it when he was baptized? Notice what verse number 21 says. Now when all the people were baptized. So when everybody's out there, when the crowds are out there, when the masses are out there, this is when Jesus came to be baptized. He did it in front of everyone as a testimony to show who he was. He, he, he was baptized when all the people were there to make it known. And he did it to identify himself with those believers who were coming out to John's baptism to be water baptized. Now, also, go back to Isaiah 53. Hold your hand in Mark. Maybe get Mark, uh, get Mark chapter 15. Mark 15, and go back and get Isaiah chapter number 53. Now, 
the people who were coming out to John's baptism, were these the people that were saying, we're righteous, that we're the good ones? It, it was not, right? Who, who were the ones that were coming out to John's baptism? Sinners. Thank you, Larry. Larry is on point this evening. <laughs> Isaiah chapter number 53 tells you something about how the Messiah was to be numbered, how he was to show up. Isaiah chapter 53, look at verse number 12. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Now, Look, there's two, you know, there's a couple different ways you could take that. You could say that the transgressors were the two other men that were crucified on each side of Christ. But there were transgressors, there were the people who in Israel who were admitting that we've transgressed the law and turning their hearts back to God and they were coming out to John's baptism to agree with what John was saying and being water baptized. It says that Jesus was going to be, uh, to be, um, uh, um, numbered with the transgressors. Now flip over to Mark chapter number 15. Mark chapter 15, look at verse number 25. It says, And it was the third hour, and they crucified him. And the superscription of his accusation was written over the king of the Jews. And with him they crucify two thieves the one on his right hand and the other on his left, and the scripture was fulfilled which saith, and he was numbered with the transgressors. So he came and he fulfilled the prophecy that he was going to be numbered with the transgressors. Now what is it that the transgressors transgress? If you're going to transgress something, what are you going to transgress? Can you transgress Jim's feelings? No, you can't transgress a feeling you have to transgress a rule or a law in in James chapter number two James chapter number two it says in verse 11 for he that said do not commit adultery said also do not kill now if thou commit no adultery yet if thou kill thou art become a transgressor of the law so if you're going to become a transgressor, you're going to be a transgressor of the law and Christ came and he was numbered with the transgressors. Um, a transgressor is, of the law is one who is worthy of what? If you transgress the law, what's the penalty of sin? Death, death. So he was numbered with the transgressors. He was on the cross with two, one on each side of him. But I want you to look at Luke, number, Luke uh, chapter number seven. Because not only is he numbered with the transgressors, he's identified in another way. And he identifies him with some people in, in Luke chapter number seven. And look at verse number 29. Luke 7, 29. And all the people that heard him and the publicans justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. Now, if I was a good Campbellite in Church of Christ, we would, they would be called baptize. They baptized. They baptized him. Um, but when it says, and all the people that heard him, so John is there, John the Baptist. All the people that heard him and the publicans, they justified God. And how did they justify God? By the way, justifying God means that it's not like they said, God, you're righteous. Let me justify you as we're justified. No, that what they're doing is they're saying that in justifying God, they're saying, God, you're right. They're acknowledging the rightness of God. And all the people that heard John, they they said that he was right, and how did they acknowledge that John was right? It says, being baptized with the baptism of John. So, 
um, all the people hear John the Baptist and they, they justify God. They're acknowledging that God's right. And what are they acknowledging that God is right about? John was calling them to baptize unto repentance, right? Something new did start with John. God, God's, God's calling them to repent. And what we're going to see is that something new did start with John, but it was not in the New Testament. Look at Luke chapter number 16. Luke chapter 16 and verse number 16. It says, The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presseth into it. Now, what was until John? The prophets. And since that time, what is it that the Lord Jesus Christ came preaching? The gospel of the kingdom, the good news about the kingdom of Israel, the literal, physical, visible, earthly kingdom that God was going to set up upon the earth. When they were being baptized by John, they were submitting themselves unto John's message. John was preaching, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so they were repenting about the kingdom that Christ was going to set up upon this earth. And this believing remnant within Israel was confirming that they believed what John was preaching. They made their belief known by being water baptized by John. Okay? Now that was expressing their faith, right? People come along today, they say, baptism is an expression of my faith in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. No, that's not the case. John was baptizing them unto repentance. Israel wasn't surprised. You know, when I said that there's nothing new, that something new did start with John, but it was not in the New Testament. When was it that John came? You have a page in your book that right before Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1, what does it say? Does, does your Bible say New Testament? I have a Bible that says in between, right before Matthew chapter 1 and verse number 1, it says New Testament. Was Christ coming as a, a New Testament ordinance? What was he coming as? When, when John the Baptist showed up on the scene, and it says there in Luke 16, 16, the law and the prophets were until that John, until John uh, that time the kingdom of God is preached and every man presseth into it and he's coming, he's baptizing for the repentance of sins. When the Pharisees showed up on the scene, did they question John about what is this that you're doing? What is this strange thing that you're doing with water? No, that's not what they did. Look, they weren't surprised by it. If baptism was something new as a New Testament ordinance, and this was something brand new, when the Pharisees showed up who you know, knew their scriptures, they just had a heart that was cold towards God, wouldn't, don't you think that they would say, what is this strange thing that you're doing with water? But you notice what they said is, they didn't say what it is that they're doing. They're saying, why are, who are you to be doing it? Are you Elijah? Are you the Messiah? No? Then why are you doing this? In Ezekiel chapter number 36, look at Ezekiel 36. My point is, is that baptism was not new and baptism is not a New Testament ordinance water baptism in your Bible is a, is a ceremonial cleansing and it can identify you with someone. But Ezekiel 26, 36, 25 says, Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. What Israel was doing by being water baptized by God, John, the baptism of repentance, they were acknowledging that God was right. We're a bunch of idol-worshiping heathen 
and we're going to separate ourselves and become a holy nation unto God. That's what they were doing. They were acknowledging it. But look back at Luke chapter number seven. As Israel is acknowledging this and they're coming out to be baptized of John, did Israel's leaders follow John? I'm sorry, did Israel's leaders follow the people? And did they follow John? Luke chapter seven, look at verse number 30. If you look at Luke, Luke 7, 29, and all the people that heard him and the publicans justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves being not baptized of him. So what is it that they're saying? The Pharisees rejected the counsel of God by, how did they reject the counsel of God? By not being water baptized. So they come along, they reject the kingdom that's being preached, and they reject the Messiah. They ignore the preaching of Christ. They ignore the wrath to come that Christ is warning them from. Uh, you know, Christ says, who, who, who told you about the wrath that's to come? You know? The baptism of John was this dividing line in Israel between the believer and the unbeliever for what was to be Israel's kingdom program. It identified those who were believing in God and what God said through John and those who were just following the Pharisees uh, um, um, without uh, acknowledging God who they don't justify him. And so the water baptism made it clear who was on whose side. And when the Lord Jesus Christ came to be baptized, who, when did he get baptized? When all the people were there. So that's point number two. He did it to identify himself with the believing remnant of Israel. Look over at John chapter number one. John chapter number one. Now the third reason he did it was also an identification issue. You could say it's a manifestation issue or an identification issue. It was to uh, manifest the fact that he is the Messiah. He was identifying who he was. Look at verse number 29 of John chapter number 1. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. John says, him right there, he's the sacrifice. That man is the sacrifice. He is the Lamb of God. You know, John couldn't have said that about anybody else that was coming to be baptized, right? So put yourself there in that crowd as you're there at John's water baptism and John is down there in the Jordan and he's down there in the water and you're there, you're around him, and John points over, and everybody's looking at John, and John points over and he says, that man, that's the Lamb of God. What is the believing remnant of Israel going to do? They're all going to turn their head, right? And see, who is it that John is talking about? And that identified Christ as the Messiah. Before Christ's earthly ministry, before he began his earthly ministry, when he was what is about 30 years old, when he was a boy, did he go around saying, na, 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 I'm the Messiah, you know, to all the other kids on the playground. He, he didn't do that. He wasn't manifesting that, right? He wasn't making that known. When did he make it known? John's water baptism. Look at verse number 30. We read 29, right? Look at verse number 30. John says, This is he of whom I said. Now, what does that tell you? That tells you that John has already been communicating some information to this believing remnant of Israel, right? He's already been preaching something about the Messiah to come uh, and about who he is. And so when he says in verse number 30, this is he of whom I said, after me cometh a man which is preferred before me for he was before me, and I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Oh, do you see that? Do you see why Christ was water baptized? John the Baptist says that this is he, the man who was preferred before me, 
and I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. We're going to make him known of who he is. Therefore, am I come baptizing with water? Oh, why was it that John came baptizing with water? Well, we read in another verse that he's baptizing Israel unto repentance to identify them as the believing remnant. And he says here in John chapter 1 and verse 31 that he's come to manifest to Israel who their Messiah is. And he did that by water baptizing the Lord Jesus Christ. Not because that Christ needed to be water baptized for repentance. Christ was being manifest. Now, John was baptizing this to manifest who he was. And how did John manifest that? We're going to read some, very, some verses that you're likely to be very familiar with. But when we read these verses, I want you to think about what we've just talked about, about the reason why John water baptized. He said it to manifest who Christ is. And now read with me, if you will, verse number 32. And John bear record. Okay, John's getting ready to say something that's going to be recorded. That is, this, is, this is something that's important. And John bear record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Huh. That's amazing, isn't it? He says, the one who sent me the baptize told me. I didn't know who it was going to be. Right? I, I, I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending. And John bear record, he said this, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven and landing upon him. So um, he's, the Lord Jesus Christ is identified through John's baptism, through John saying that the Holy Ghost uh, came upon him. In Isaiah chapter number 42, in prophecy, Isaiah 42, 1, it says, Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect, and whom my soul delighteth, I have put my spirit upon him. And so in the New Testament, you come along and they say the one on whom you see the Spirit descending and staying upon, this is he. So when John was baptizing and Christ came to his baptism, he testified to who Christ was. He was the Messiah. Now, John was letting Israel know who the Messiah was. Turn over to John chapter number 10. John chapter number 10. The, the Pharisees rejected the counsel of God. Now, I've, I've made my point, okay? I've made my point. The reason why Christ came to be baptized is that in, in tonight's lesson, lesson number two and three are both identification issues Reason number one was to fulfill all righteousness. Reason number two was to be identified with Israel. Not all of Israel, not with the Pharisees, not with the ruling class, but the believing remnant of Israel. And reason number three was to be identified himself as the Messiah. Now those Pharisees who came to John's baptism, they rejected the counsel of God. What does that mean that they rejected John's water baptism? I only say that for the fact that I, I, those of us, if um, Grace Bible Church stands on the fact, as, a, as Paul says in Ephesians, that there is only one baptism for today. That's a spiritual baptism. That water baptism has no place in the dispensation of grace because it serves no purpose for us in the, in, in the dispensation of grace. It doesn't identify us with Israel because we're not part of Israel. Our hope is not with Israel. 
We're not Christ. We're not being baptized to fulfill righteousness. We're not being baptized unto repentance to say that God is right. Because what Paul tells us is the moment that we believe and put our faith in the cross, that God justifies us, that he imputes his righteousness to us, and that we're made right with God. I believe the gospel and I'm made right with God. I don't go to a baptistry to go down into the water to say that I'm right with God or as a testimony that I'm right with God, that we're baptized by the Spirit that indwells us, and that's the powerful one. That's the one that you need. That's the one that you want, not the water. But they'll say, you know, those who say, well, obviously water baptism is in the Bible, so why do you reject it? Because they don't understand that there's been a change in God's dealings with man. That God's not working with uh, the body of Christ like he dealt with Israel. He, we're not under the law. We're not under a covenant program. We're not under the circumcision program. And, and water baptism is not some New Testament ordinance that we have to take part of like the Jews took part of circumcision. That's not the deal. We also realize that Peter was preaching baptism for the forgiveness of sins in Acts chapter number 2, and that you had to be water baptized in order to be saved. Not that the water saved you. The church of Christ, they'll come along, the Campbellites, they'll say that it's clear that Peter says you have to be water baptized in order to be saved. And we say a hearty amen to that. At that time when Peter was preaching that, and to the audience to whom Peter was preaching that, that was correct, and that's right. When we say that we don't believe in water baptism to, for today, that doesn't, mean, believe, that doesn't mean that we don't believe in water baptism. That means that we believe in water baptism the way that God had purposed it and what he meant for it to do and to accomplish. And so I just want to point out uh, one thing there about those who did not accept the water baptism and did not justify God in what he was doing. John chapter 10 and verse number 1. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold. Now, this is Christ talking, and Christ identified him as the shepherd of the sheep, right? And who was the sheep? Israel, over and over again, identified as the sheep. Who is the sheepfold? This is the believing remnant of Israel. Not all Israel is going to be saved. And so he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name. And leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. So, in the, I've already mentioned that the, the sheep is Israel, the Lord is the shepherd. The nation of Israel is in apostasy against God. God is calling them out unto repentance. And he's, he's, bringing them, he's bringing them out. And there's a door into the sheepfold. The leaders in Israel were the unbelievers. They weren't coming in through the door. They rejected the counsel of God unto themselves. And they were trying to not come in by the door. I think the porter is John the Baptist. John the Baptist opened the door for Christ. He came in by the door and the shepherd, as the shepherd of the sheep, and they hear his voice. He came in through the door, he was acknowledged as the shepherd, and there he is. And what did the rest of Israel do? They want to get into the kingdom, but they're not going to come in through the door. They, they disavowed John's water baptism. They didn't justify God. They didn't acknowledge that it was true. So he goes in through the door, Christ does, to prove that he's the shepherd of the sheep. He's manifesting himself as the Messiah, and Israel's rejecting him. So Christ's baptism 
was an important piece of identifying himself as the true shepherd to Israel, as their Messiah. And the other, le- the other leaders of Israel, they were thieves, they were robbers, they were refusing John's baptism. I think we'll stop there for tonight before we get into the, to the, the, the next entrenchment on water baptism and we move forward. It's a good breaking point. So let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we love you and we're, we're thankful for your word. We come together to study it, not to be haughty or high-minded. This is not some academic exercise where we're looking to show others that they're wrong and we're right. But Lord, we study our, our Bibles to show ourselves approved unto God. And we want to understand these things and we want to and we want to live out the truth of your word in our lives and we want to do it properly and correctly and to not be in error but to have confidence in our faith and not only who you are but what you have for us to do. And so we search the scriptures and we study these items that may not be for us but to help us understand why they're not for us. We're thankful for your son who makes all of this life possible that we get to enjoy. We're thankful that he died for us. In Christ's name we pray, amen.